Thanks very much, Justin. So, <clears throat> Barnum and Bailey Circus, uh, Mr. Barnum once said, you can fool some of the people all of the time, and all of the people some of the time. So this talk is going to try and not do that, but rather there'll be something about the accelerator system and something about the science that we've done. So if one part or the other bores you, you're welcome to sleep, and I'll know if you're asleep through the whole thing that you really didn't want to be here in the first place. Let's see if this works. Ah, God, now it's going to be, I have to get smarter. LCLS, the world's first hard x-ray, free electron laser. The other thing you should walk away with is it's not a laser and it's by no means free. Um, and one last point, so then you can go to sleep, is that the turn on was just as if you'd walked into this room and swip, sw switched uh, the lights on and the machine was operating uh, with performance parameters beyond the baseline within a period of about four hours. That's an incredible tribute to the accelerator team at Slack who's been using this machine, some of them, in fact, uh, for nearly 40 years. Uh, so we know the LINAC extraordinarily well, and that will be an interesting experience to see how the European X-ray Free Electron Laser in Hamburg turns on, where they've got to commission everything from A to Z. Oh, God, is this not going to... This is going to be frustrating. No. Modern technology. Do I get an extra five minutes? Resume slideshow, yes. Good. So we're going to quickly go through hard x-ray FELs today. A brief comment about the LCLS. Then I try to give you a bit of a flavor for the uh, recent science results, as Justin said. And then finally, uh, sort of some near-term and long-term things that we're going to do in California to keep a step ahead of the Europeans. Now, <clears throat> from Claudio Pellegrini, he points out that in all of the accelerator-based light sources, the trick is to maximize the number of photons per electron per unit time. It started with uh, uh, bending magnet radiation. It moved to undulators. And then, using this uh, 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 SASE process, self-amplified spontaneous emission, you get gain. You're increasing qualitatively the number of photons per electron. And the solution, obviously, then is the free electron lasers. The proposal actually came from Claudio and collaborators in 92, uh, where he said from 4 to 0.1 nanometers based on the SLAC LINAC, and there's a workshop report. Uh, you can download that from uh, the SLAC site. And uh, one is forced to have high gain, i.e. use electron beams with large peak current at the same time small emittance and energy spread. The road to an X-ray FEL requires the development of an electron beam with unprecedented characteristics. So to make an FEL work, all you have to do is produce this wonderful electron beam at a high uh, electron energy sufficient to meet the resonance parameter, the resonance condition, and you produce short wavelengths. However, that's a non-trivial challenge. What you want, in principle, is a beam with a transverse uh, uh, phase space that's the wavelength of the light you want to produce divided by 4 pi. So in the transverse phase space, it looks like a single particle. And then you want to bunch that beam with the wavelength of the light that you'd like. Ideally, you'd like to make a single bunch with the wavelength of the light that you'd like, and then it would radiate coherently by itself. So the photon beam you produce <clears throat> can have pulses as short as of order 300 attoseconds if you could isolate a single spike in the SASE spectrum at the shortest wavelength that we run at, which is about one and a half angstroms to femtoseconds. In fact, at the longest wavelengths that we run at, you can get pulse durations as long as a few hundred femtoseconds, perhaps up to 500. It's nearly fully coherent transversely, as long as you meet this condition that the wavelength divided by 4 pi is greater than or much greater than the emittance of the beam. And so when you go to the longest wavelengths at LCLS, you tend to meet that criteria because the electron energy <coughs> goes down uh, uh, as you get to a shorter wavelength, uh, longer wavelength. And so you, uh, uh, the emittance, the transverse emittance, uh, although going down, the wavelength goes down more rapidly. High field strengths or high peak power, you can express the peak power in terms of electric magnetic fields of the beam, and unmatched peak brilliance, and Justin alluded to that. It's nine orders of magnitude better than any other source in that single parameter. And you can express the 
saturated power in terms of something called the Rho parameter or Pierce parameter times the energy in the electron beam. It's energy in GeV and it's peak current in amps. Now, <clears throat> there are various ways you can do this. Uh, this comes from a document by Kwong J. Kim and Jiren Wang that's unpublished. You can do something which is easy, and that's where we started. And then you can get ever more difficult. This is self-amplified spontaneous emission. It's basically the amplification of the noise in the beam. You could then use an external light pulse to uh, uh, provide a seed and then use the electron beam in this uh, uh, undulator magnet as an amplifier, or uh, go to the extent if you could make mirrors that operated at these short wavelengths into an oscillator. And in fact, Kuang Jian and collaborators at uh, uh, <coughs> Argon have proposed what they call the XFELO, an oscillator. It's going to have, in principle, a bandwidth of order a millivolt at 10 kilovolts and repetition rates of order a megahertz with 10 to the ninth photons per pulse. And the critical thing is getting these diamond crystals that there's one, two, three, four that make up the cavity that have reflectivities approaching 99%. And that's now being demonstrated with some exquisite crystals grown uh, by high pressure, high temperature techniques by the Russians. Now in this business, uh, the uh, free electron laser at Flash, formerly known as the TTF uh, Tesla test facility, uh, was the first machine operating uh, at wavelengths that, that some people would call x-rays. They now operate to four nanometers. And that has provided a tremendous amount of science and technology in the FEL game over the last 10 years. And uh, many of the people that use the LCLS, Justin amongst them, have gained experience first at Flash. And if we look at the population, and if you go down to the experimental hall, it pays to be fluent in German as well as in English. The most recent success, early success, is a machine, Fermi et Lettre, in Trieste. And uh, what they have is the first seated operation, uh, a fully seated machine. Uh, this is the uh, uh, storage ring at Lettre, synchrotron at Trieste. And then they have a LINAC and an experimental hall, which when I visited in December was empty. But uh, during the machine advisory committee, uh, you know, you bring a committee in, for success, and uh, the evening of the first night, uh, the Italians went back to the control room, and uh, by the next morning, they had uh, clear evidence of the first seating of their beam. So that's the, the sort of prehistory. Now, here we are. We turned on in 2009, uh, 1.2 to 25 angstroms at the moment. Uh, on the 31st of March in uh, Harima in Japan, they will produce photons because that's the end of the Japanese fiscal year and they do everything on time very precisely. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, they will have an FEL that's going to operate down to one angstrom. It's a very important project because of two things. One, uh, uh, Shintake has a very novel electron source. He has a DC gun, which he proceeds to chop to get this very high peak current. And the other thing is we operate to get to, if we were to get to one angstrom at an electron energy of order 15 or 16 GeV, he has a machine that operates at one angstrom at 8 GeV. It reduces significantly the footprint of the accelerator and therefore its cost. The Europeans, like us, are going to uh, use a sledgehammer to kill an ant. They're going to have an accelerator with 17 GeV of electron energy in a kilometer, three kilometer tunnel that they're boring as we speak underneath uh, the ground in the Hamburg area. And that will go from one to 60 angstroms and they have an operational date at the moment of 2015. The Swiss, not to be left out, Lenny Rifkin and his colleagues are going to do a little better than the Japanese. They hope to get to one angstrom at 6 GeV. They've just finished a test accelerator where they're going to do some R&D that very similar, in fact, to the test accelerator that sits on the Spring 8 site. And they're looking at a 2016 date. They were hoping that the Swiss parliament and people would move it ahead so that they were 2015 minus epsilon. But unfortunately, the political process has put an extra year delay in their project. And then, uh, I would have said this was a certainty until the recent political turmoil in the US. Uh, we're on our way to LCLS 2, uh, hopefully keeping us uh, in line or a bit ahead of the Europeans. And uh, uh, that has a target date of 2017, but that at the moment is uh, somewhat uncertain. <clears throat> 
Uh, and there are many soft x-ray machines around the world. And uh, I emphasize that we've been fully operational and serving users since fall of 2009. And then, not to be outdone, the Koreans have a project from 0.6 to 60 angstroms, which supposedly has started in January of this year. And they have a 2014 to 2015 completion date, which is aggressive. OK. So what is a SASE free electron laser? Well, as I said in the beginning, you need a very bright high energy beam that's bunched and then a linear accelerator that provides much brighter beams than a ring. The electron is injected into a long undulator and an array of periodic alternating dipole magnets and stimulated emission is resonantly amplified by the interaction of the radiation with the electron bunch. Spontaneous, self-amplified spontaneous emission. <clears throat> so it's this resonant interaction of the field with the electrons, the light field, the electrons slip behind the electromagnetic wave by exactly one wavelength per undulator period. There's the undulator period. And you can describe the strength of this magnetic structure by a parameter k, which is proportional to the on-axis magnetic field times its period, and it's 0.93 times the field in uh, uh, kilogauss times the period in centimeters. For LCLS, that number is about three and a half. And then uh, you produce some light where you have a transverse component uh, to the uh, uh, electron trajectory so that the light field can couple to the electrons. They can gain energy or lose energy depending on the phase. And as you move down the magnet structure at these zero crossings, you continue to amplify that radiation. And lo and behold, out comes light at a wavelength that's determined by the strength the magnetic strength parameter goes like roughly the square for large K and one over the square in the electron energy. So it pays you to go to very high electron energy. And it also pays you because the emittance at the energy that you produce the light is the one that's relevant for this lambda over 4 pi consideration. And so high energy means you've got a small emittance. So due to this uh, interaction between the light and the electron beam, some electrons gain and some lose energy you drive an energy modulation of the beam at the wavelength of the light. And then, because of the magnetic structure, the energy, electrons that lose energy slow down and those that gain energy catch up. And that drives a density modulation or microbunching at the wavelength that you would like to produce the light. And then this microbunched beam will coherently radiate. It's essentially a, pancake, a set of pancakes of charge at that wavelength. And you see exponential growth of the power. So this is a movie of that process for the TTF uh, that was produced by Sven Reiki, who's now at the Paul Scherer Institute associated with the Swiss Fell. And in the vertical plane is the transverse size of the beam. You're going to see it grow and shrink because as it goes, the electron beam traverses this 100, in our case, 100 meters or so of magnet, you need to keep an overlap between the light field and the electron beam. So there are a set of focusing magnets along the way. So you're going to see the beam grow and shrink vertically, which is just the effect of these focusing magnets as the beam traverses this very long structure of, of uh, uh, the undulator. And the horizontal scale is the spacing of the electron bunch in units of one over the wavelength. So this is as the, as the beam goes along, exponential growth, and then finally saturation. I think. OK. Now, the other thing, of course, I know the answer, but every time I look at this, if you look, it clearly doesn't look like a simple sine wave. So not only do you get the fundamental, but you also get the third, the fifth, and higher order harmonics. So the third harmonic, for example, if we were running at 8 kilo electron volts, would be at 24 at half an angstrom, and it has about 1% of the power of the fundamental. All right. So I think this is the last one on the accelerator. <clears throat> This is a, a slide that Paul Emma uh, created to give you a scale of the difficulty of doing all of this in space. So you have to preserve this one angstrom or one and a half angstrom microbunching over a long undulator. That's a path of order 130 meters. All right, so there it is. And here you are in the electron bunch. Its transverse size is about 60 microns full, full width, 30 microns half width. And there's the microbunching. All right. That's one angstrom, 10 to the minus 4 microns. So 
Let's put that on a scale that you can, you know, put your hands on. Let's now draw this more accurately, choosing a one millimeter period. And the aspect ratio is such that it's two kilometers in the other direction. So you've got to maintain this microbunching with that sort of aspect ratio over this 130 meters. That means micron sensitivity in terms of overlap between the electron beam and the photon beam, a straight trajectory to that kind of scale, and timing and so on of various components along the way. So uh, it's a non-trivial activity, but like I say, these guys at Slack are that good. You walked into the room and turned on the lights. So what does it look like from above? For those of you familiar with California, it should look a little green, and that means it must be the winter. When they built the, the three kilometers or two miles of LINAC, uh, beginning in the early 60s, <clears throat> among other things, this highway wasn't there, but they were very smart. They put the bridge uh, uh, over the uh, uh, LINAC in the right place so that uh, it wouldn't disturb the accelerator when you finish the highway. Uh, they also installed at a kilometer and two kilometers down along this three kilometers of accelerating structure some off-axis tunnels to allow you to either inject or extract the electron beam. So the LCLS started at the two-thirds point using the last third with the capability to accelerate electrons to about 14 or 15 GeV. And we built a new injector that has an angle of 35 degrees with regard to the main axis of the LINAC. We modified the last third of the LINAC. We made a transfer line across the research yard. For those of you that have been at SLAC, this is a sort of a cutout. There are two large uh, uh, concrete experimental holes for particle, fixed target particle physics. Then this 130 meters of undulator sits underneath the hill behind the, the uh, research yard, and that's important for temperature and uh, uh, vibrational stability. And then there's 200 meters of X-ray transport between a near and a far experimental hall. Inside the tunnel is the last third of the LINAC, 14 GeV accelerating capability, a radio frequency uh, RF photocathode gun and off-axis injector. We take a bunch that's uh, a few picoseconds long and compress it twice so that it ends up to be a, a pulse duration of order 100 femtoseconds by the time you run it through the, the uh, uh, undulator at the end of the LINAC. There are some transverse deflecting cavities which basically act as street cameras so you can measure the longitudinal length of the electron bunch. And then uh, in order to make these compressors work, they work very similar to prism compressors in lasers. You want to make the chirp of the beam linear, and so we have a, a, a cavity, so-called expand cavity, which runs at four times the main frequency of the LINAC. And then there are a bunch of emittance and diagnostic stations along the way, and various collimators in particular to be sure that you don't run the electron beam into the undulator structure, and a fixed gap 132 meters with a bunch of position monitors that are good to better than a micron, and finally, 500 meters of X-ray transport in these near and far experimental halls. So as I said, you walked into the control room and turned on the switch. So this is a measurement on the 26th of April in 2009. These are the measurements of the integral of a spot on a YAG screen some 50 meters downstream at the end of the undulator. And uh, the blue line is the Genesis simulation that Zhirong Wang did of the data. <clears throat> and the most exciting thing, I think, aside from the fact that you turned it on and it's saturated instantaneously, was the fact that the gain length that comes from this fit is 3.3 meters rather than the 4.3 meters or so that's in the baseline design. And that's because the slice admittance at the end of the LINAC at 14 GeV is 0.4 microns, essentially being able to preserve the emittance, the projected emittance that you see out of the photoelectron gun through the full acceleration and compression process and transport through the undulator, which means that uh, if you had uh, su sufficient magnets with a sufficient K parameter, which is going to determine the uh, wavelength of the light, uh, make an undulator period that's shorter, this quality beam would have saturated at about 15, 16 kilo electron volts in the 130 meters of structure that we have in principle. But the design is based on lasing with 14 GeV at one and a half angstroms, and so that's where we are today. Saturation length of 60 meters in the 112 meters 
of magnetic structure that we have. All right. So, from his point of view, these are the important things. How fast, and I know that Justin, amongst other users, were surprised, as we were, that uh, we could do these things. And then the user immediately says, we want you to be able to do this for us at the push of a button. For example, you may want to change the pulse rate, and that we can do literally with one button push from 1 hertz to single shot to 120 hertz, which is the typical repetition rate of our machine. We can change the wavelength now from 25 to 1.2 angstroms, and depending on which direction you go, it can be as uh, uh, fast as five minutes if you're going up in energy, and it may take as much as an hour if you're going down in energy. And if you want to change a percent or two, they're now able to do the following. You say, I, I have a monochromator. I want to pick out a narrower bandwidth than the self-amplified spontaneous emission bandwidth, and now I want to track that in a sinusoidal way. You call up the control room and you say, we'd like you to, to give us a sinusoid that's going at uh, a frequency of, uh, let's say, plus minus 1% every uh, two minutes. And then they can just sit there and have the thing continue to uh, produce uh, saturated laser pulses and just dial the photon energy. So if you wanted to do a scan in photon energy over a few percent, you can do that with this monochromator locked into the machine. The pulse energy, uh, we've seen now as much as four millijoules at uh, the shortest wavelength. That's a factor of two to three more than in the baseline design. But notice it's easily lowered, but it may take a few hours to achieve greater than two and a half, and that also depends on the wavelength. So everything has to be tuned up to get to this sort of two and a half value. But if you walk in on a given day, you'll see basically two millijoules uh, across the full spectrum. We can vary the pulse length from 60 to 500 femtoseconds. That's also very straightforward. The long wavelength uh, limit is the 500 femtoseconds. At shorter wavelengths, in order to maintain the peak current, we need to have a shorter electron bunch. The peak power, and I don't have the next slide, I don't believe, can go from somewhere between zero, if we have zero here, to about 40 gigawatts, and it actually turns out to increase uh, with the shorter pulses. And finally, uh, Yun Tao Ding and collaborators, and there's a PRL that describes this in, in about a year and a half, two, about two years ago, said, look, if we go to very low charge, these parameters are all at 250 picocoulombs, a quarter of a nanocoulomb. At low charge, in one to two hours, uh, we can get pulses that are less than 10 femtoseconds, and the more re most recent measurements that put an upper bound on the pulse duration say that it's about four and a half to four. Uh, four to four and a half femtoseconds in that mode of operation. So, we move on to the stuff that's important after you make the light. This is the last, uh, uh, here's about one and a half kilometers, and then from here to here is about another half kilometer. The undulator, and then there are three experiments in the near hall and three experiments in the far hall, and Justin is sitting waiting with bated breath for the matter in extreme conditions instrument, which is at the very back to turn on uh, at the end of this year, beginning of calendar 2012. So <clears throat> they have labels uh, to match the Department of Energy. We decided we should have three letter acronyms, atomic and molecular and optical sciences, soft x-ray research, x-ray pump probe, x-ray coherent scattering, coherent x-ray imaging, and matter in extreme conditions. So this is a, a the first of the uh, stations to have turned on. And in fact, in the first experimental campaign, which was in fall of 2009, the breadth of science far extended beyond atomic, molecular, and optical physics. And I'll show you two results, in fact, uh, that point to exciting opportunities in uh, structural biology. Uh, soft x-ray research is just that, research with soft x-rays. Uh, uh, I'll give you a, a, a quick picture of uh, an experiment that Andrea Cavalleri who's a quarter time here, I guess, and three quarters of the time at Seafell in Hamburg, and Justin's uh, early work on her, uh, uh, aluminum, uh, hot aluminum. And then, uh, I believe, uh, some discussion of the most recent uh, uh, instrument to turn on, CXI, the coherent X-ray imaging. Okay. So <clears throat> the AMO station is the first one, uh, John Bozick and Christoph Bostedt are the instrument scientists, and John 
Jean-Michel Castagne is the instrument engineer. The picture doesn't show very well, but it's basically a, a classical uh, uh, X-ray instrument focused on doing atomic, molecular, and optical science. It has a, a chamber with a bunch of electron and time-of-flight spectrometers, and uh, underneath is an ion uh, time-of-flight spectrometer. You can inject the, the gas sample from this side. There's a set of adjustable focusing mirrors based on the so-called Kirkpatrick bias geometry, which is a set of mirrors, one to focus in one direction, and then orthogonal to that to focus in the other direction. And as an interesting note, Mr. Kirkpatrick was a professor at Stanford, and Mr. Baez's biggest claim to fame is he's Joan Baez's father. And then there's a magnetic bottle <laughs> spectrometer uh, that sits in this uh, uh, diagnostics chamber. And in fact, this diagnostics chamber is on wheels, and it was wheeled out and something called the camp chamber coming from uh, the advanced study group of the Max Planck in Hamburg replaced it and it was used for two experiments that I'll describe. So, <clears throat> you start in atomic, molecular, and optical physics. That was the first experiment described in something called the LCLS First Experiments document, which is SLAC Report 611, that was <clears throat> part of the process to convince the Department of Energy to spend what it turned out to be about $400 million to build the LCLS. And the first experiment they described was kind of the brute force and ignorance uh, thing that you would do, which is to expose a rare gas to the LCLS beam and see what happens. So the neon K edge is at 960 electron volts. That's the uh, photon energy required to photo eject a single 1s electron from this closed shell atom. So what happens is these are three pictorial sorts of things. The top one says that's a valence excitation. So you come in with this X-ray and you photoionize a valence electron. The purple one is the photoionization of the deep core, the 1s electron. And then the black one is the Auger process. That's a process. If I make a deep core, what's the probability that that core hole is filled by an electron and you emit an electron? That's an Auger process or the core hole is filled by an electron and you emit a photon, uh, that's uh, fluorescence. So these are the sorts of steps that can occur. Obviously, if I come in at 800 electron volts, and this is a paper that was published in Nature uh, in 2010 by Linda Young's group from Argonne and collaborators, if I come in below the, with a photon energy less than the K binding energy, all I can do is photo eject all of the valence electrons Neon has 10 electrons, two of them in the core, the 1s state, and eight others. And lo and behold, you come in at 800 eV, and there's a sequential process of excitation of the valence, and you end up with neon 8 plus. And you can observe that by looking at the ion time of flight spectrometer that measures the arrival time of the ions. Actually, what it measures, it measures their arrival time, and what you know is it's a measure of Q, the charge divided by the mass. And since it's neon, you know the mass, so it's easy to understand as you look at this spectrum in time, which charge states are there. What can also happen is you can come in at uh, an energy above the binding energy of the deepest core electrons in neon, 1,050 electron volts, and then everything goes along pretty well. I photo eject one of these electrons. I have an OJ process that has filled that one. I do that once, twice, three times, and then what you discover is that because you've gotten rid of these outer electrons, the binding energy of these cores is now greater than the 1,050 volts. And then you can only have two left. You've got two still in the core, and you end up with neon plus eight. But you've started, in this case, with an energy above the binding energy of these deepest cores. You could, on the same time, start with something that was way above, and then you can just keep going because you have more than enough energy to photo eject even the two 1s electrons when you've got a plus 8 charged neon. So away you go. And then what they discovered was that if you make this pulse shorter, it turns out that there isn't enough time for this sequential process to complete itself. And so you don't end up with plus 10. Now, <clears throat> neon is interesting for the variety of reasons, and in fact, back, I think, in the late 60s, see, that's what happened, Justin, there's symbols that are, that's an alpha, 
there was a proposal to use uh, photon-driven, uh, make photon-driven lasers. So Nina, Nina Roeringer and collaborators from uh, Livermore, Colorado State, proposed and did the following experiment. They took the LCLS beam at uh, uh, 960 EV into a, uh, essentially not quite an atmosphere of neon gas. And then it turns out that there is a radiative transition which occurs sort of one time in 80 compared to the OJ decay with a lifetime that's much longer than the OJ lifetime, which is some few femtoseconds in neon. And then you can actually drive this uh, 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 lasing process. There's a threshold at of order about 0.8 millijoules of LCLS pulse energy. And you can observe the lasing phenomena, which is about a part in 10 to the third of the incident number of photons. This is a, a, a resolution limited line at 850 electron volts, 1.9 EV wide. That's the uh, 1s uh, uh, k alpha emission from uh, neon uh, 1 plus that, as I say, was proposed in, in 67. Uh, and that uh, shows uh, exponential gain uh, as a function of the medium, uh, length of the medium, and the energy of the driver. The advantage is that with the fluctuations in and 20 EV wide of the incident beam, you come out with a purely monochromatic beam that should be, in principle, longitudinally coherent. So it is an attractive sort of thing, albeit discrete in terms of the photon energy that you produce. Now, <clears throat> for those of you familiar with the, the push for these free electron lasers, you will realize that what many people had said was that the thing that it's going to do is it's going to allow you to measure the molecular transform of single biological objects and then by a process called oversampling where you can, by measuring at twice the frequency of the uh, pattern that you would like to invert, you can then get both the phase and the amplitude from uh, a scattering pattern that otherwise uh, you have this canonical phase problem because you merely measure the intensity. So the thrust of that was in, in large part due to the enthusiasm of Janusz Haidu, who was at Oxford at one point and is now at Uppsala. And uh, if you look at uh, the cover of the LCLS first experiments document, for example, you'll see the uh, molecular transform of lysozyme, which is the, the fruit fly of protein crystallography. So his group, uh, in collaboration with a bunch of others, there are actually 80 authors on this paper in Nature that just came out in February. So it's the size of a, a small particle physics group. They uh, uh, have been interested, Janos and his collaborators, in the structure of this so-called Mimi virus, which is the largest known virus comparable in size to a small living cell, with the hope of inverting diffraction patterns taken from single uh, Mimi viruses and try to get uh, high resolution images of what's inside. They're big enough that uh, uh, electron microscopy, uh, you can't get the electron beam through it, and it also tends to be frozen. Here, they inject these into the vacuum chamber and with a rather uh, a sophisticated two-dimensional X-ray detector, collect these diffraction patterns. And in principle, the viruses, when, if you were to inject them into the vacuum and then take them out again, they're still okay in terms of their function. So as I say, it's too big for electron microscopy and so on. Here are some reconstructions from this uh, uh, scattering pattern, some constrained and some unconstrained. And uh, what's exciting from their perspective is that you can reconstruct them. The resolution is about 20 nanometers, and that, I believe, is determined uh, by the size of the object. So if the object were smaller, it turns out the resolution would actually be better. Uh, there's, a, I think, a straightforward application, uh, uh, understanding of that. But it's the first step towards uh, this process of trying to uh, image these objects with hard x-rays. Well, <clears throat> this idea of taking the diffraction pattern from single objects, uh, in particular if it was a single biomolecule, is a very exciting idea. Uh, but uh, you can win a bit. In fact, you win 
if it's a small crystal, by the number of molecules in the crystal uh, uh, squared. So it's a significant amplifier. So if you did this experiment not with one molecule, but with 100, you would get 10 to the fourth times more intensity in the scattering pattern. But you wouldn't, however, sample the scattering pattern uniformly. You would see the peaks appear where there's constructive interference between these molecules in this small crystal. On the other hand, it's a very attractive opportunity because there are many proteins that you can't grow crystals, uh, the analog of the size of your fist, but rather things that have maybe 10 by 10 by 10 molecules only in them. And so they did a first experiment, Henry Chap Chapman, who's at the Center for Free Electron Laser Science in Hamburg, and collaborators, again, some 70 or 80 people in the same issue of Nature. And this is a diffraction pattern from, uh, 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 this is one diffraction pattern from this so-called photosystem one, and they were able to take many, 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 some 15,000 nanocrystals, diffraction patterns, index them, and then in turn get a map of all of the, uh, the Bragg peaks that you observe, and then invert that structure to the limit of the edge of the detector they had, which is a nine angstrom map. And then this is that nine angstrom map calculated by a technique called molecular replacement. Basically, you know the answer, so then you fit the answer to the existing diffraction data. So let's fast forward to two weeks ago. We have just turned on this so-called coherent X-ray uh, imaging instrument. Sebastian Boutet and Garth Williams are the instrument scientists, and Paul Montanez, the lead engineer. It's some 15 or 20 meters long, and what's there today is a beryllium lens that sits somewhere is over here that focuses the beam to a few microns in the sample chamber that's over here. And in that sample chamber, uh, you can move a two-dimensional detector as close as 50 millimeters and as far away as four meters. So it depends on what angular range uh, you would like to collect scattering data to and, in particular, what uh, uh, resolution you hope to get. And they took Photosystem 1, and that doesn't show up very well, and they put it in the instrument, shot in the nanocrystals in the same way they had it up front with uh, uh, wavelengths of order pick 0.6 angstroms, um, six angstroms, and when you come here at one and a half angstroms, you get scattering out to three angstrom resolution from these same nanocrystals. So if they're able to take this data and solve structures, it will revolutionize the protein crystallography game, which has, over the last, well, I think probably forever, been limited by samples, and now you've gone from uh, scales of, of tens of microns to of order 100 nanometers, so the number of crystal structures that should be available for solution will go up by, again, another factor of 10 or more. So this is actually an extremely exciting result for the protein community if they're able to solve uh, the structure with that data. Okay. So, back to the normal progression. And I'm doing all right, I guess. If I move to the soft x-ray uh, science or research end station, uh, Bill Schlotter and Josh, Josh Turner are the instrument scientists, and uh, Michael Holmes was the uh, instrument engineer, and Michael Rowan was responsible for the grading monochromator system here. It and the AMO station work in the energy range from the lowest energy that we get to, which is just a bit under 500 electron volts, so below the K edge of oxygen, out to 2 kilo electron volts, limited by the reflectivity of a set of mirrors that are in the system, including these KB focusing mirrors. And the only real difference is that they've added a grating uh, uh, into the line so that they can choose the photon energy and, and determine the bandwidth by the resolving power of that grading instrument, which means that the bandwidth is determined by the instrument and the um, central wavelength is stable because if the LCLS beam were to wander off, all that does is mean that the intensity coming through the exit slit of this instrument fluctuates with the variation in the photon energy produced by the accelerator. And that photon energy is varying all the time because of a... Uh, 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 changes in the electron energy from phase uh, uh, fluctuations in the RF drive system. Okay. They've got, instead of one or two end stations, they've got the old roll-in, roll-out end stations. Individual groups bring them. There's, uh, and I'll give you a quick thing about this EBIT, which was just running maybe three or four weeks ago, a collaboration between the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg 
and Lawrence Livermore Lab. Uh, Justin, I don't remember which one of these you used. Uh, not this one. Maybe this one. I think this one. Yeah. Right. Uh, there was a liquid jet experiment. Uh, that's a chamber that comes from Max Lab, a CFL in the MPI in Göttingen. And then the Stanford people have these two. Okay. So that says, when does an insulator become a metal? Um, there's a large class of solid state systems, strongly correlated systems, that have all kinds of interesting magnetic uh, properties, superconducting properties, and so on. And they are very often characterized by having uh, order not only in the atomic positions, but order amongst the orbitals and order amongst the various charge states of a given ion in the lattice. And then what you can do is you can do scattering experiments, say, imagine that the orbital ordering, the ordering of the 3D orbitals in iron, uh, has a periodicity that's twice that of the underlying lattice. If there's a periodicity that's twice in real space, it produces, in reciprocal space, uh, coherent scattering at half the period that you would normally see from the average structure. What you can then do is come in with an optical laser and heat the system. You can do that by uh, tuning uh, to uh, a phonon, for example, of a specific frequency by using uh, terahertz, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with micron scale light. Uh, and then you can look at the evolution of the intensity at one of these peaks that corresponds to the order, the orbital order in the system. You can also be sensitive if you do resonant scattering to the magnetic structure, again, if its periodicity is greater than the uh, uh, underlying lattice, again, if it's twice the size of the unit cell. And so this was an experiment by Hermann Durer and collaborators looking at uh, now a, a well-studied system, magnetite, Fe304, and looking at the evolution of the magnetic scattering as a function of fluence of an external laser. And uh, this is the intensity decrease as a function of the fluence in millijoules per square centimeter. And they see not only the uh, decrease in the magnetic intensity, but also a shift in the uh, 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 central energy of the uh, resonant scattering due to the excitation by this optical laser. And it turns out that they see agreement uh, with the predictions of the change in the band gap in this system, published in PRL, uh, in this measure in PRL. Now, you can do this in systems, and this is from uh, Cavalleri and collaborators uh, 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 to be published from CFEL with people from Brookhaven, John Hill and Company, ALS, uh, and uh, LCLS, where they were looking for uh, uh, similar changes in the local order in uh, <clears throat> A manganite, one of these strongly correlated complex oxides. And here, there's magnetic ordering as well as charge ordering and orientational ordering. And they're looking at the interplay between uh, these various order parameters as a function of the excitation of the light. In this case, in particular, instead of using 800 nanometers, they tuned uh, uh, the incident light near uh, an optical phonon in the system to look in particular at the decay and uh, uh, of this order as a function of delay between the electron, uh, the photon beam, and the exciting laser beam. And uh, this gives you access to the interplay between these various uh, systems, the uh, energy exchange, and so on. Now, Justin is going to stand up and talk to you about this experiment in aluminum. I think it was a surprise for you when you did this, it's fair to say. So <clears throat> the K edge of aluminum is at. Justin? 1560. 1560. And this is a bunch of spectra that uh, correspond to photon energies uh, from 1558. Oh, so this is all above. All right. I didn't read it in detail. Wait a minute. Come here. <laughs> So <clears throat> this is emission as a function of excitation in this system. And uh, uh, 
let's see, this is the temperature that you deduce from the emission spectrum. So it's a way of measuring how hot this aluminum is. And then he didn't send me the exciting data, which is that he sees uh, uh, similar sorts of spectra. So this is aluminum 5, aluminum uh, 1 through 4. So this is the uh, uh, increasing charge uh, uh, states of aluminum and the emission uh, from those states. So the binding of the 1S hole gets uh, deeper, very similar to the neon case, although there's a lot of more multi-photon ionization and impact ionization in the system, which gives you these charge states. And so what you see is that the emission line, as you go to uh, higher excited states, uh, gets to shorter and shorter wavelength. And they're able to do deduce the temperature of the aluminum system from this emission spectra. But as I say, the, the, he didn't send me the more exciting results, which are the emission below the K-edge, which is a very interesting uh, and previously unobserved phenomenon. So EBIT. Uh, Jose Crespo uh, and collaborators in uh, Joachim Ulrich's lab in, in, at the Max Planck in Heidelberg have this electron beam ion trap system. So what they do is they do spectroscopy on highly charged ions. And in particular, this is iron 16 and iron 15 plus. And it's of astrophysical significance, somewhere along here. And in particular, what's important is trying to understand the ratio between the th so-called 3D line and 3C line in iron 16 plus. And it's complicated because there's uh, emission from the iron 15 plus B line and some of that underlying the iron uh, uh, 16 plus 3D line. So this was for the first time the ability to do resonance uh, laser spectroscopy uh, extended into the x-ray domain for highly charged ions. So they've got uh, uh, a countable number of ions in this electron beam ion trap. And then by looking in detail at uh, these emission spectra, which you can do by coincidence, uh, knowing when the uh, uh, LCLS uh, uh, X-ray pulse arrives, uh, you can then do spectroscopies that were not possible until you had the sufficient intensity from the X-ray beam. And you're able then, by doing the 15 and 16 plus, to get a very good measure of the ratio between this 3C line and 3D line, which <coughs> uh, Jose tells me has significant impact in one's understanding about the emission from faraway astrophysical objects. So. For me, the, the, one of the, the most exciting things is that this new tool seems to be broadly applicable across biology, high energy density science, uh, this astrophysical experiment, basic understanding of, of uh, atomic physics, and uh, measurements in condensed matter physics, in particular in this general area of strongly correlated systems. But there are more things that we could do than that and more things that we have done. And so let me give you a little bit of flavor for that. Let's see, we'll go through this a little bit quickly. All right. So this is how one of these bunch compressors, which is crucial to the lasing process because I need a few kiloamps of peak current. What you do is you accelerate uh, this bunch off uh, crest so that the accelerating field is different for the head of the bunch and the tail of the bunch and that produces a chirp beam. And then you pass it through the analog of a prism compressor where the high energy and low energy electrons, some at the head and some at the tail, have a different path length. And then you can compress this beam. You can shorten it in length, uh, maintaining the energy spread that you have. You could over compress it or under compress it. Now, what Paul Emma and colleagues realized was that in the middle of this compressor. Here is space, and the colors represent low and high energy electrons. I now have access to the longitudinal bunch, how long the electron bunch is in, in, in space or in time, in this transverse direction. And it turns out to be a pretty big dimension. So what Paul and collaborators decided was, if they put a thin foil, say, of aluminum in the beam and put a slot in the middle, then I've got all of these electrons, say the 250 picocoulombs that are 150 femtoseconds long, and the coulomb scattering will spread out the, the beam, spoil the transverse beam size, everywhere except where the slot is. 
And as I said in the very beginning, I need to have lambda over 4 pi, roughly, for the transverse emittance, for the thing to undergo this self-amplified spontaneous emission. So these electrons and these electrons, which find themselves, unfortunately, going through the aluminum rather than the slot, don't undergo the SASE process, and only a small fraction of the beam, therefore a small amount in time, going through the slot lasers. So, in fact, as ugly as this is, this is such an aluminum foil. There's a V here with a bunch of lines so that the thing doesn't fall apart completely. And I guess you should be able to see over there, there's two slots that basically are along that V pattern, and then I don't quite know what's on the top. So this is kind of neat, right? I've got two slots now. And so now I end up with not one but two pulses that are not coherent with respect to each other, but about two femtoseconds long. And at the top, some uh, 150 femtoseconds apart. And then I can do a pump probe experiment. I can just vary the position of the slot and vary the pump in the probe. So that's another thing that's kind of simple to do and that we have done already. All right. If you take the single slot and put it in there, it's addition by subtraction because, after all, the electrons that aren't in the slot don't laze, and so I'm going to lose intensity, but I reduce the pulse length. And this is a single-shot spectrum, actually using uh, uh, the low-charge mode with a narrow slot, and you get something that's about 5.3 electron volts wide, and that's approaching transform limit at this wavelength. So you can get a pretty good uh, single spike, or maybe two spikes, maybe there's a little bit of a shoulder there, uh, uh, spectrum, by just simply putting this slotted spoiler. But it's not quite there yet. The thing that you'd like to do is you'd like to be able to seed, uh, as I indicated in that early view graph, and amongst other seeding schemes, there are some that require two pulses. So we put two bunches in the machine, n times 300 picoseconds apart, uh, 8.4 nanoseconds or so. And this is a measurement showing that both of those bunches lays. So that also works quite well. We can do multi-bunch at least two. Now, Flash has done some 500 bunches. Uh, we haven't quite done that, but these are a lot closer together than the 500 that they have. All right. So let's go back to the seating scheme. As I indicated, you could use an external laser and use the FEL process as an amplifier. And in fact, you can do a little better than that. You can do something that's called high gain harmonic generation. What you do is, as I had indicated in that, that movie, you get not only bunching at the fundamental, but also at uh, uh, higher harmonics. You produce light at higher harmonics. So what I do is I seed, and they did an experiment seeding with a CO2 laser at 10.6 microns. They have a structure which is resonant at that wavelength. So now that seed is amplified. And then you put that uh, modulated electron beam through a dispersive section to change this energy modulation into a spatial modulation. And then make a radiator that radiates at uh, half of that wavelength, so a harmonic of that. And then you can produce, you start with the laser at 10.6, and the second radiator comes out at 5.3 microns at half the wavelength. And hello. And sure enough, there's what it looks like. And this is the same plot. It's a narrow line. It's about twice the transform limit. This is now taking this, the self-amplified spontaneous emission background and multi multiplying it by 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth. So it's a very clean, high harmonic line. Now, <clears throat> it's very hard to get a seed at one angstrom. And if you tried to do this even with a tie sapphire starting at 800 uh, nanometers, you'd have to go through many, many stages of this process by going, uh, taking it at 800 nanometers, then a third of that, and a third of that, and so on and so forth. However, uh, uh, Jupp Feldhaus and collaborators back in 97 said, look, all I need to do instead of trying to get the, the seed from the, the external laser, I'm going to do so-called self-seeding. They had made this proposal to do this using uh, a grading spectrometer for the flash machine. Uh, you come in, you make light, I deviate the electron beam that gets rid of the bunching that was imposed on the beam in this structure to make the light, and then I put a grading monochromator in between, and then I superimpose this 
grating narrowed line from the SASE spectrum onto the electron beam and then make an amplifier in the same way that you would in this case. And then you have to match this path length with the light path length and away you go. Now, <clears throat> that's something which takes a lot of effort in terms of, of uh, construction and so on and so forth to make it work. But uh, uh, Gianluca Geloni and collaborators at DAISY are actually working for us. Uh, they have a preprint out uh, last year which says uh, something like low cost upgrades for LCLS. So they made a very clever proposal. What they said was, we're going to, and I'll show you in the next slide, we're going to install a single crystal of diamond, now not operating at, let's say, 800 electron volts, but at 8 kilo electron volts, and then a very weak chicane, and I'll explain why you need the, the weak chicane. The distance between the electron beam here and the photon beam is only 2.7 millimeters, and then what it turns out you can do is you are making a seed, now not at 800 electron volts, but at 1.5 angstroms, and in particular, the way this works, there's no path delay in the X-ray beam. This chicane is only necessary to move the electron beam from sitting on top of the, the SASE spectrum to a part of the spectrum that you create by this single crystal. Then you amplify it, and then you can actually do this tapering. And the proposal was that uh, you could get as many as 100 gigawatts of peak power out in a very narrow bandwidth. So how does this work? Well. <clears throat> You've got this noisy spectrum, and then you put this single crystal of diamond in it. Now, if you take the Fourier transform of the noisy spectrum in time, or this is in distance, so it's 3.3 uh, femtoseconds per micron, you see this large peak which would be going through the roof. That's the stuff that has gone through the diamond and has not undergone the scattering process. And then you take out a notch. This is the so-called forward diffracted beam from the diamond. So over this bandwidth, essentially all of the light is scattered out of the beam. So if you take the Fourier transform of everything and add to it pi out of phase, the Fourier transform of what's missing, that turns out to be a bit which rings. Since it's causality, you can't have anything before the bunch is there. And there's a peak at about minus uh, uh, four or five uh, microns compared to where the bulk of the light is. So now all I need to do is move the electron bunch in the second undulator from here to here, and then the field that's superimposed on the electron bunch is monochromatic, determined by the bandwidth of that diamond crystal that scattered that light out. And these are three simulations from 1.4 to 1.6 angstroms. And what you see, in fact, is as you go to longer wavelength, for a variety of reasons, you end up with more seed power. It's increasing with a slightly greater delay. So now you need a knob to move the electron bunch, and that's this small chicane that moves the electron bunch about 2.5, 2.7 millimeters away from the photon beam. And it turns out that's very easy, at least in your mind, to implement. This is this 130 meters of undulator, and let's see if I... Maybe one more? Yes. So the, it's made up by... 33 segments that are about 3.4 meters long. They have devices at either end to measure the position of the electron beam and a bunch of things that can move them around, and in particular, a set of uh, 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 drives and a, and a platform that allow you to move the undulators in and out. So you can sort of turn off one magnet at a time. Now all you need to do is replace this same section with Three di four dipole magnets that move the electron beam 2.5 or 2.7 millimeters away from the diamond crystal and a diamond crystal, and away you go. You just take one section out and replace it. And that's a CAD drawing uh, from John, John Amon and Deming Shu. Deming Shu and the people from Argonne are responsible for the, the, the manipulation of the diamond. This is a single girder. It exactly replaces this black thing and the dipole magnet sitting on it replace an existing uh, uh, chamber and an existing undulator. So it's an A for B. We've already done studies by pulling one of these out to see the impact of not having one of those undulators in terms of the performance of the machine, and that's a sort of 10 to 20% effect 
So by the end of the year, this will be in place, and we're confident, along with our DAISY collaborators and people from Argonne, that we'll have a seated beam by the end of the year with a stable central wavelength and a bandwidth of less than 1 times 10 to the minus 4 at 1 and a half angstroms with 40 to 60 gigawatts of peak power. And I'm sure Justin and collaborators will be excited to use that as well. So one last thing, and then I'm done, and that's LCLS2. So the smartest thing to do is, you know, build on success. If you've got one injector and one undulator line, just simply take another third of the LINAC and make another injector and another undulator line. And so we're going to have two LINACs, and we're going to be able to run both of them up to 14 GeV, or if we remove the so-called energy doubling, only up to 360 uh, hertz instead of 120, but then limited roughly by a factor of two in electron energy, and uh, then build a bypass line and another set of undulators. In fact, we're going to have two undulators. Uh, they are one half uh, designed to produce soft x-rays and one designed to produce hard x-rays as part of the project, and they will rely on variable uh, uh, spacing of the magnetic structure in order to tune the photon energy rather than tuning the electron energy, which means that we can run those two from the same electron source at different uh, 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 photon energies and tune those photon energies. And the layout preserves the possibility for up to 30 GeV and still one, or using uh, still one more of these three Linux. And there is a uh, concept that is, uh, people are looking at that would use 28 GeV beams to produce one angstrom or so that could give us something between 1 and 5 terawatts of x-rays, more than an order of magnitude, more photons per pulse than we can get today. And that's a capability that we believe will remain the private domain of SLAC with 3 kilometers of LINAC. So in summary, these X-ray FELs work. The early science looks at X-ray matter interactions and clearly provides a window into the capabilities as we turn on more and more of these instruments. The next step is the control of the longitudinal phase space, <clears throat> which at the moment we don't have very good control over, albeit with the monochromator in the soft X-ray instrument, we certainly do better. But we still have fluctuations, significant fluctuations, because the beam is not seated. But as Justin will tell you, What's missing in all of these experiments is that we need diagnostics on the photon beam on a shot-by-shot -shot basis because it's a chaotic source. Its transverse structure as well as its longitudinal phase space are not under control. So thank you very much for your attention.